Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined once again by Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy, who's going to take us through a thought provoking episode on the term sub Saharan and the whitewashing of ancient North Africa. Yes, yeah, so I, I just think we should sort of like. Um, because this idea, this like sort of continually trying to find this idea of, you know, separating out North Africa from sub-Saharan as if the Sahara was the impermeable boundary <laughs> that nobody could get through is really a, a continually um, problematic point, uh, type of argument, um, particularly since we have early texts that tell us that, right, Herodotus tells us that, he says the Ethiopians and the Garamantes are indigenous to North Africa, and that, of course, the Phoenicians and the Greeks are not. Um, but he makes it very clear that people he call Ethiopians are indigenous to North Africa, and Northwest Africa in particular, um, right? Um, but they are not sub-Saharan. <laughs> so I, I just think, I just, I, I constantly, what is the obsession that people have with this idea of sub-Saharan, that whenever they ask any question, what they're trying to do is prove that sub-Saharan Africans aren't part of the ancient Mediterranean world, which we know is false. Um, not only do we know, of course, that um, people that we would call quote-unquote sub-Saharan Africans um, ruled Egypt before the Persians got there, um, among others, but that they have this continual culture that runs up and down the Nile. Um, and we know from our ancient sources that um, they believed very firmly and they interacted with what in the area that they called Libya, right? Um, so, so ancient geography, Herodotus separates, there's a big geographic debate in the fifth century, right? So on the one hand, we have Hecateus, um, who has his map of the world and Herodotus seems to be addressing him and trying to correct him, um, at various points, um, in his history. But there's debate of whether there's one continent or two continents, whether everything west of the Nile is its own continent called Libya or whether it's not. Um, one of our ancient sources actually has Europe and North Africa as one continent. Yeah, because Libya is the name that he uses for everything west of Africa, essentially, is what Herodotus uses. Um, but it's also used at some points for the entire continent of what we call Africa. Because remember, Africa is a Roman word. It's not uh, a Greek word. They didn't call it Africa. But yeah, this idea that we, there's a, a natural impermeable boundary that starts at, that at the Sahara Desert and that there's no penetration and that everybody who has quote unquote black skin is below that line historically um, and everyone above that is somehow magically white um, shows one, a real lack of knowledge of how space works and how geography functions and how mobility and movement in the ancient world functioned. It shows a very limited view of our ancient sources. Like, like I said, I, I think I said this um, in another clip, uh, you know, if you're going to live by Herodotus, you got to die by Herodotus too. And if you're going to cite Herodotus for evidence of one thing, then you have to accept the fact that Herodotus says that, that black people, Ethiopians in our ancient parlance, Ethiopians really in our, in our ancient parlance, are indigenous to North Africa. <laughs> They're indigenous to Libya, um, which is his word for basically everything north of the Sahara, because as far as he's concerned, south of the Sahara is uninhabitable, right? They believe that that was an uninhabited region, uninhabited zone. <laughs> Nobody lived there. It was too hot. So this is, this is you know, you have to, to understand that our ancient sources were very clear that in that northern part of Africa, that's where Ethiopians lived, <laughs> were indigenous to. That means there were black people there. Um, but also the people that we refer to now as either Nubians or Cushites, um, those were also called Ethiopians by our Greek sources. And they were in Egypt <laughs> and they controlled Egypt for various times. And we actually have a lot of evidence if you put um, Egypt into its African context in antiquity, um, its vision is not to the north, right? It, it looks to the Nile and to, to what we would call south, right? To the upper Nile, the upper Egypt. Um, and in fact, the, the, the cult of Isis is actually integrated across um, the, the, what we would consider the two separate kingdoms of Egypt and Nubia um, in antiquity. But their worship of Isis is almost identical and they are integrated um, and looking to each other uh, as early as you know the, the second millennium BCE, 
So we, we really just need to not think about this separation, which isn't even a modern separation, right? This idea of sub-Saharan is a modern racist trope that there is a magic dividing line. And it is a modern racist trope that develops back from, I mean, I, I'm thinking I should look, do an engram, Google engram just to see when the term sub-Saharan first pops up in books, right? Because one of the things you can always tell is when things start to get hot and when they're not. But if you look at someone like um, Cuvier, who was one of the early um, scientists dealing with race back at sort of the turn of the 19th, 18th to 19th century, so 1801, uh, 1802 or so. He's the guy who um, uh, got Sarah Bartman's body after she died, the, the hot and hot Venus, uh, and had it stuffed <laughs> and had her genitals and things preserved for study. Um, he makes clear comments about um, how taking the heads of mummies, which they were sort of just getting at this time out of Egypt, and her dead body uh, and her face and putting them together. And so here's this like 6,000 or 4,000 year old mummy, mummified head, which clearly is not in its original form, <laughs> right, with her body, uh, a model made of her, and says, look, it's very clear from looking at these two that regardless of whatever their skin color was, they're clearly different races. Um, because their heads are different, because this he was a cranium, craniometry guy. Um, so, so, so if you sort of think about when is this obsession with sub-Saharan kicking in, it's kicking in when we're trying to, in a period of time where we're trying to separate off Egyptian, the, so these modern king, these ancient kingdoms that are being discovered by modern Europeans, um, and the sort of black south. Um, and actually, I'm looking at a Google engram right here that goes back to 1800, uh, up to 2008. I'm going to smooth it out here a little bit more. And the term doesn't start to appear in books anyway, in English, in the English language until roughly 1978. <laughs> so, so, you know, why? <laughs> why does this term emerge? Um, it, it has like very little life um, before that, and then all of a sudden in the 1960s and 1970s, um, I see a, here's an appearance of it in um, on communism and the Soviet Union uh, in sub-Saharan Africa is one of the earliest ones that you're find, I'm finding and marketing. Uh, so that divide seems to be one that has to do with economic policies and what they're viewing as economies um, in the modern state. It's all about development. So... I think when people ask about this stuff, what they're really trying to ask, and they don't want to ask the question, so they use this phrase sub-Saharan, is, are Egyptians white, like us? <laughs> and they don't want to say that, because if they say things like that, then, you know, because what happens when you sort of subsume whiteness for the entirety of North Africa, right? You want to claim the ancient civilization without modern Islam being attached to it, um, and so you, and then you want to separate it from blackness. That's the only reason why people use this term. There's no genetic <laughs> distinction to be made here. There is no um, political distinction to be made here in antiquity or in even clearly up until the modern world. If people aren't using the word, um, they're not making a distinction about it until they want to use it. All of Africa was a colonial playground until a certain period. And then we're going to make a distinction between the oil rich Arab states and the um, mineral rich and other resource rich exploitable states below the Sahara that are not oil rich states, right? Agricultural versus other. So I think anybody asking the questions about sub-Saharan and how these ideas apply to the ancient world need to stop because they are clearly, absolutely modern impositions of ideas and ideology. And very clearly they are very recent modern um, impositions. And whenever people say that they want to avoid uh, imposing modern ideologies, onto ancient world, they're okay with imposing modern ideologies onto the ancient world as long as it's their modern ideologies, like the category of sub-Saharan. <laughs> so I think we need to like nix that one. What you're really asking is, are they black or are they white? Um, and the answer is neither and both, but really neither. There's no white people running around in ancient Egypt. Um, <laughs> it's just not a category that they used. They did recognize that people had blackness, black skins, um, and they recognize dark skin tones, but they, the idea of the white is, is a gender category um, or a category used for people who are cold burned in the very far north 
um, or it is a category that is used for people with certain diseases. Um, or we actually see it in a poem by Catullus referring to Caesar for a political party affiliation, the blacks versus the whites as a sort of political thing or a, and then we'll see it, the other place where it might be connected to these sort of politics is that it's also can be connected to chariot racing, your team, your favorite team, the greens, the reds, <laughs> um, these are teams. The, the whitewashing of North Africa also ties in, um, if you think about this thing, the idea of whitewashing North Africa, some of the, the loudest voices on the internet um, in wanting to ensure this dividing line between sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa are um, people of Arab descent. Um, I'm thinking here specifically of like N Nicholas Tlaib, right? Um, because particularly in the United States, since 1910 or so, right, the people who are called Syrian get to be white, right? So they're categorized technically, people from the Middle East are categorized as white because of this 1910 or 1919 law um, that categorized them as white. Um, but they don't get to live the experience of being white in America because they're Muslim. So, but I think there's this, there's this bind into people who have recent access to whiteness, particularly in the United States, but also um, in the Middle East where there is anti-blackness, uh, severe anti-blackness, um, that they want to um, make sure that they can make that harsh dividing line, right? Um, and they are some of the loudest voices. And so whitewashing of the Middle East is a, an ongoing long-term historical process, but in terms of how uh, Europeans and Americans are doing it, Europeans are doing it primarily as a way to lay claim to the antiquities um, of Egypt and um, Libya, which of course it's colonized by the Romans. And so you find Roman sites all over. Um, Libya um, and other places. Um, but then in the United States, it has to do with the fact that, that people who at the time were co classified as Syrian, but what we really mean is people of Middle East descent or people Arab, uh, of Arab descent from the Middle East, they got classified legally as white. And so think about what that looks like as someone like me, who is a white person, right? A European descent white person saying to someone who is like, like Talib or something that, um, North Africa isn't white, right? Um, or more, even more important is that this is actually what happened during the Mary Beard Talib debate, <laughs> which was Beard was like, they weren't white, you know, Libya and these places are not white spaces. This is not a concept that exists in the ancient world. And Talib comes after her and says, who are you colonizer to kick me out of whiteness? Right? But it's all this obsession of wanting to participate in this dominant identity group um, that is called whiteness which has no roots in antiquity and has no roots even um, really in much modernity outside of, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a creature of the U.S., though it, it appears in European texts earlier. We're the people who sort of run with it um, and turn it into um, this idea. And what we actually mean by white is dominant. We don't mean anything to do with our actual skin color.